First, Orrin Lyons. Um, Orrin is class of 58, uh, received an honorary doctorate in 93, and received the George Arendt's Award at Syracuse University, our highest honor for, for alumni in 20, 2011. He's a faith keeper of the Turtle Clan of the Onondaga Nation and sits on the Onondaga Nation Council of Chiefs. The Onondaga Nation is the central fire of the Six Nations of the Iroquois Confederacy, or the Haudenosaunee, which translates as people of the Longhouse. A lifelong lacrosse player, Oren, as an All-American at SU, and together with his teammate Jim Brown, led SU to an undefeated season during his graduating year, 1958. He was later elected to the Lacrosse Hall of Fame and serves as an honorary chairman on the Iroquois Nationals lacrosse team. Upon graduating with a degree in fine arts, Oren became a very successful commercial artist. He accepted a teaching position with the University of Buffalo and was named a SUNY Distinguished Service Professor and Professor Emeritus of American Indian Studies. In 1997, Oren was the founding member, member of the traditional circle of elders and youth. This council of respected Indian leaders meets annually to provide an avenue for Native American culture to inform and contribute to contemporary culture and political debate. In 1982, he helped establish the Working Group on Indigenous Populations at the United Nations. He is the recipient of the United Nations NGO World Peace Prize. In 1992, he addressed the General Assembly where he opened the International Year of the World's Indigenous Peoples. He served on the Executive Committee of the Global Forum of Spiritual and Parliamentary Leaders on Human Survival. He is a frequent participant in human rights issues in Geneva <clears throat> and recently received Sweden's prestigious Friends of the Children Award along with his colleague Nelson Mandela. Among his other honors are the Ellis Island Congressional Medal of Honor, the National Audubon Award, the Earth Day International United Nations Award, and the Elder and Wiser Award of the Rosa Parks Institute of Human Rights. Oren is also the subject of a PBS documentary by Bill Moyers and recently appeared in 11th Hour, a documentary on the state of the natural world and climate change produced by Leonardo DiCaprio. He is the author of several books, <clears throat> including Exiled in the Land of the Free, co-authored with John Mohawk. Yawaha, Pete. We'll lean on this chair. In 2003, when uh, Condoleezza Rice and President Bush were beating the drums of war, you remember? Weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass destruction. You remember that? I heard those drums, I heard those drums. There was a man that was standing up in a corner of I-90, 84, north, south, with a sign. One man, no war in Iraq. That was Pete. Uh, man of conviction, always was and always will be. Thank you. And I remember, you know, we're going to talk about canoes. He's remind me about the canoes, you know. <laughs> I'm lefty, but <laughs> sometimes you gotta do this way. I was in a boys' camp, first time, just a kid, I think maybe 16 or 17, I agreed to go up there and be a counselor. Didn't know anything about it up in the Adirondacks. And of course, being an Indian in a boys' camp, well, 
you got to know everything, or they think you know everything. You know? <laughs> so it came to be one day that we're going to go down and uh, we're going to canoe. And I saw the canoes down there, and I think, boy, that's pretty nice. Never been in one in my life. You know? <laughs> so they said, Chief, you know, all Indians are chiefs. <laughs> Chief, you want to go down and go out on a paddle? I said, Yeah, yeah, I would like to. And he said, uh, you want to sit in the bow or in the, in, the, in the rear? And I said, well, I'll sit in the bow, okay. So I went up and I sat down facing him. Because <laughs> I, I didn't know better. <laughs> and he sat there, he started looking at me. He says, are you going to turn around? <laughs> and I said, I just want to see if you knew how to get in that canoe. That's <laughs> <laughs> where so I learned to be an Indian at that Boy Scout camp. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was fun. It was fun. Anyway, you know, we're talking about the river and talking about the two row and uh, Vessels. It is a river. You know, we're on the river of life. We're, uh, we're tied together, covenant chain, peace, friendship, long as the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, long as the rivers run downhill, long as the grass is green. Three links. Covenant chain. You know, when, uh, Jake, Jake Edwards, one of our young chiefs. Got two more young chiefs. Would you guys stand up so they can see you? up the load. I got a young Tadadaho here. That's a heavy load that he carries. It's tough. Tough trying to live a life of principle and just be fighting all the time. That's what we do. So here it is. This is the belt. Calico Santa. 1613. It's a 400 years now. It's going to be again. And so, when the Dutch came, first came up the river, there was an Englishman in charge of the, the boat called Half Moon. And uh, it went as far as it could go up the river in Mohawk country. And his uh, name was Hudson. You know, all he had to do was go up that river once and they named the whole river after him. After that. <laughs> I don't know how they do that. You know. <laughs> this is once. He owns that river now. He was up there and then he went back and a few years later, uh, Dutch came up with another boat, and uh, there's a lot of stories in, in there of where they sat and who they talked with and the villages they stopped at and what they ate even. There's a lot of stories. You have to go back and you have to, to dig it up, but it's there. They keep records, you know, what our, our brother knows how to write, and he keeps good records. So anyway, uh, when he got up there, they said that they wanted to make an agreement to trade, trade and commerce in a peaceful way. And our leaders at that time said, you know, we've been watching you and it doesn't look like you're going home. So maybe we better talk about how do we get along before we talk about trade. 
And so they began a long discussion. That discussion went over a period of probably 50 years or so. And it was being refined all the time. But basically what they said was, it's a good thing that you, you want to trade in a peaceful way. So how shall we greet one another? And they said, well, it's very respectful and great love if you call us father. And, uh, and they thought about that and they came back and said, it's True enough, they said, Father loves his children, he said, but he also has the responsibility and the authority to chastise. And we think it's probably better if we call one another brother. So that's where the term brother comes from when we speak of our brothers across the sea and across the water, or our brothers. And it's a inclusive term, means all people. So they agreed, we will call one another brothers. And we said, you have a big ship, you have a lot of people, you have a lot of religions, you have a lot of color in your people. Our canoe is small and it's it only holds our people and it holds our way of life and <coughs> simplicity. We live a simple life, but it is what we have. So we'll have our two vessels then, your ship with all your people, your laws, your religions, our canoe with our people, our way of life. Because they didn't call it religion, they call it the way you live, <coughs> day, day to day, a way of life and our laws, and our rules, and our people. And they thought that was a good idea, and they said, this river that we travel on, this river of life, we should go down this river side by side. And so they agreed with that, and they said, we should tie our vessels together, something strong, and they talked about rope, and they talked about iron. Well, it would rust eventually and disappear. And eventually they decided on silver because you have to polish. You have to remind people. So they agreed there would be a chain, silver covenant chain. And if you look in your history books, all your teachers out there, you'll see over 350 years of a discussion of the chain. Three links, one, two, three. Peace, friendship, so long as the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, as long as the water runs downhill, and as long as the grass grows green. And the two vessels tied together. It's a long time. The sun's still rising in the east, setting in the west. Water's still going downhill. It's also going down. And the grass is kind of brown now. It's turning brown. Our leaders were just out to Ogallala just a week and a half ago, and flying from Denver up to Rapid City, that streak of snow that come around here. But from there north was all brown. No snow, no water. Last year they had a very, very hard time. This year they're gonna have a hard time again. And so the discussion here now is starting to change. And they said a lot of things. And they said, how will we keep this, this discussion? And 
our leader says, well, we always use these beads, this wampum, and we'll, we'll make a belt, and you write your letters, you write your letters and keep your records, and when you lose them, come back to us and we'll have the belt and we'll remind you what, you, what we said. 1975, we were having problems at Onondaga, if anybody remembers. Pretty serious problems. And there was a man in the White House called Theodore Mars. And he wanted to come up to Onondaga. He's very interested in Six Nation. And we said, we had gone down to, to greet him and invite him, actually. And he said, yes, I want to come up. And we said, is there anything that you would want to address specifically so we can prepare? He said, I want an explanation of the two-row wampum. That's 1975. So your mind goes back to what they said. 400 years earlier, when you lose your records, we'll have our belt and remind you. <laughs> and then we have a picture of Dr. Mars standing there and all our old leaders holding the belt like this. And he was a good man. He was a good man. He had something in mind for us. Never did quite come around. But in this belt, there were a lot of words. And I said, well, we make this agreement. In the future, they said, how will our children know you? How will our children know each other? And the leaders replied, you will know us by the way we dress. Uh, that was an instruction to our people to maintain yourself, maintain your integrity, wear your clothes so you know who you are. <coughs> and so that's why you see our leaders and our people wearing our clothes. Uh, we can wear your clothes too, we do but we always have our clothes. And we keep our, our customs and our ceremonies. The ceremony is probably the strongest thing we have because it holds our nation together and has to be in our language. And these young men here, those two young men there, this young man here, are becoming fluent in their language. The leaders which is what we have to have. And of course you remember that during the course of time when our brothers kind of forgot this, they began to try to take the language away. Missionaries came among our people to change our beliefs. Yet our leaders hung, hung on and all that time, they, were, took, they took our children, put them in schools. Started from 1875. They put them in schools and tried to beat the language out of them. Tried to change them. Little children, Carlisle Institute, Pennsylvania, go down there sometime and look at the graveyards. <coughs> Look at the graveyards of the children that didn't get home, and look how small graves there are there. Our children, they were being changed, but they weren't successful. I'll just move forward very fast, past the First World War and into the Second World War, and things were very, very bad for the United States in the fight. And they were losing the battles here and there, especially in the Pacific. And 
His father was there. He's a good soldier. He's also a boxing champion of all, all of the military, 147 pounds. That's his father and a great soldier. And things were bad and they had to communicate. So they found out that Indians had kept their language. And so you had the code talkers speaking openly across open lines, one Indian talking to the other in their language, saving thousands of American lives. And remember, this is the very same language they were trying to wipe out. Remember, or if you didn't remember, think about it. Consequences. You were lucky. Our people fought back and didn't lose their language. You were fortunate. Probably a lot of you wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for that language. Just want to remind you, like this belt. This belt is a covenant between two peoples. And you're the other half. It's very important. And if your leaders want to ignore it, you shouldn't. It's a responsibility you have to be there. And I'm so glad I see so many here. I'm glad you're here. I greet you. We have an agreement. I'm going to polish it. Polish that chain. 350 years of history, if you go through it. Our good friend Rick Hill. He's a funny guy, Rick. He went and took it upon himself to find out all the meetings where they used wampum. There's three volumes of meeting after meeting after meeting where our brother used wampum, made the belts, made the strings, exchanged them, made the protocol. On the eve of the revolution, 1775, they wanted a meeting, peace meeting, Albany. Our leaders went there. And they said, we want you to join us in this coming battle. And our leader said, we know your father. We know you and your children. We don't think it's a good idea to get in between a father and son fight, as you well know. And they said, good, because that was our second request. If you don't fight with us, don't fight against us. And so they struck a treaty at that time. And the speaker for the Continental Congress said, and the full membership was there at Albany, 62 members, said, in 1744 you instructed us to make a union like yours. We are now going to take your advice. We're going to make a union like yours, and we are planting this tree of peace here and we are kindling this fire. Your words, not ours. Did you know that? Of course not. That's real history, one that you don't know, just like this belt. And our man said, we agree. We agree with this. They said, but you will see our men in the field on either side. And when you see them in the field, remember, they are not fighting as a nation or as a confederacy. They're fighting where their heart took them because they are free men and we can't tell them what to do. And so it was 
that the Mohawks fought heavily on the side of the king. And the Oneidas and the Tuscaroras fought heavily on the side of the colonists or the Americans. Prior to that, you know, when you said American, they were talking about an Indian. But now they said, we're Americans. We're free. We're free. Pete was talking about our little square of Onondaga down below here. He said, it's not the USA. It's Onondaga. And that's what it's always been. It's small. It's free. Still free. Still leaders. These young men got a big job. Sat in that council since, well, it's over 45 years now. And I've seen a lot of history, and I've talked to a lot of people, and as you know. But what comes to my mind now at a time like this is, this is a time of decision. We are in global warming. It is not going to get better. It is going to get worse. And when things get worse, people have a way of falling apart or coming together. That just depends. Depends on what you have here. So prepare yourselves, all of us. I'm not talking to, I'm just talking to human beings. We're a family. We can change blood. Whether you're black or whether you're white or yellow or red or whatever color you want to talk about, you can change blood, which means you're a family. We're related. We're a species. John Mohawk said, well, he said, as far as I can see, human species is still a biological experiment. Mm. <laughs> That's where we are, folks. What's different 400 years ago and today? What's different? Seven billion people is what's different today. 1950, 2.5 billion people. 63 years later, 7 billion people. That's different. Who's teaching them? And my question is how? How do you instruct 7 billion people as to their relationship to the earth? How do you do that? And that's where we're at. Because if you don't respect nature, Nature's the boss. You know where we are? We're, what's up the street here? It's a big high. What? Build a big high wall, what? Is that called Wall Street over here? Isn't that right here? Remember the 99 percenters that were over there? Remember them? And of course the media, which is run by corporations, said, it's too bad those kids don't know why they're there. And they're there going like this. Hey, it's your problem. And they spun it. And all of a sudden said, yeah, those kids just don't know why they're there. But of course they did. And they were removed. They had to leave, remember? There's something different about those kids. You know what was different? They were your kids. They were white kids. They weren't black people. 
They weren't Indians, they weren't Chicanos, they were white kids, your kids, talking to you. That was different. Anyway, they moved them, because that's what they can do. And then, last October 29th, they got another visit. Who visited Wall Street October 29th? The Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. 14 feet of it right over here. Couldn't remove it. You couldn't remove that. That's nature. And all of those privileged people in the penthouse, when the energy went out and shut down, the lights went out, their toilets stopped, and they had 50 floors to walk down, and 50 floors to walk up, and carry water, and carry a slop pail. And you know what goes in a slop pail? <laughs> Nature's the boss. The sooner you understand that, pay attention to that, the better off we're going to be. And if your leaders don't want to do that, then you lead the three leaders. That's your job as people. You tell them. It's your life. It's your children. It's your future. You tell them. And be vocal. And get on this river with us. We're coming down. We're coming down in canoes. We're coming down in boats. Coming here. We need a place to stay for at least three days. <laughs> Out in Lakota country said they were coming with horses, they said. We'll follow you along the bank. Indian nations over the West Coast said, we got canoes. 20 guys in it. I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but we're starting it. And it's, it's a good idea. This is a Turo. This is a covenant of peace and friendship. It's an old one. George Washington held his belt. Franklin held his belt. They all held his belt. So here we are again. And we're asking you, you're the other half. That's you right here. It's us right here. Here's the river of life. And we're bound together, that covenant chain. Just a reminder, done it. Mm.